All right, so in this video we will begin chapter 4, Metrics on Probability Measures. Here we will continue studying convergence of probability measures, only now we'll be in a more general setting of general metric spaces rather than the real line or Euclidean spaces as in the previous chapter. At the end of this video I want to go over a few basic observations mostly from real analysis, which are scattered throughout this chapter, but which I think are useful to point out and keep in mind from the very beginning. But before we do that, let's take a look at the general structure of this chapter. Alright, so if we look at the table of contents, we see here that we have four, actually five sections. The first one is bounded Lipschitz functions. The second one is convergence of laws on metric spaces. Then we have Strassen's theorem relationship between metrics. And then we have Wasserstein distance and Kantarovich Rubinstein theorem. And the final section is Wasserstein distance and entropy. Okay, so right now I'm going to go over each section and make a few quick comments. So we get a general idea what this chapter is about before we dive into, into each section in, in more detail. Okay, so let's jump to section 4.2 for a second. So right here we recall the definition of weak convergence of probability measures. Of course it means convergence of integrals for all continuous bounded functions f. Now it will be convenient to notice right away here in, in statement 2 of this portmanteau theorem that instead of checking convergence for all continuous functions we can look at a special subset of the so-called bounded Lipschitz functions. So in section 4.1 we will introduce this class of bounded Lipschitz functions on a metric space and then basically recall a few standard results from real analysis that will be useful to us. So let let me jump to the section 4.1 right now. Okay, so here is the definition of bounded Lipschitz functions, which is exactly what the name says. Okay, it's a bounded and Lipschitz functions on our metric space S. So once we give this definition, we will prove a few basic results about them, which I'm going to skip right now. Okay, and then we will recall the stone weierstrass theorem and also give a proof here for convenience, which together with the properties of bounded Lipschitz functions that we proved earlier will allow us to conclude immediately that if our metric space is compact, then the set of bounded Lipschitz functions is a dense subset of all continuous functions with respect to L infinity norm. Okay, this result is already one step away from the statement in the portmanteau theorem that I mentioned earlier. Then we will also recall artzela ascoli theorem here and when applied to bounded Lipschitz functions, it will immediately give us this well-known corollary that if our space is compact again, then the space of continuous functions is separable with respect to L infinity. Okay. Of course, this will be very useful because instead of checking convergence of integrals for you know, bounded Lipschitz functions, it will be enough to check convergence for countably many of them, okay, at least on compact spaces. For separable spaces, we will just have to add a, a few more details to get the same statement. Okay, so that's basically all uh, the content of this section 4.1. So now we can go back to uh, section 4.2. Okay, so this section 4.2 starts with this portmanteau theorem, which we have already briefly looked at before. And it collects several conditions which are equivalent to the weak convergence of probability measures. Now, after we prove this, we will give a quick application to convergence of empirical measures, which is stated here in Varadarian's theorem. Now, in the next video, we will go over this section in a bit more detail, so 
I'm skipping most of the details for now and right now I want to focus on what is the main content of this section. So first of all we will define two metrics on the set of all probability measures. We first will define what is called the levy prokhorov metric and then after we prove that it, it is indeed a metric we will define another metric which is called the bounded Lipschitz metric. And this will bring us to what is probably the main result of this section. Um, in this theorem we prove that these two metrics that we just defined Mitrai's convergence of weak convergence of probability measures. So one can think of the set of all probability measures with the topology of weak convergence as a metric space itself, which is of course very convenient. Okay. Moreover, this metric space of probability measures in some sense inherits good properties of the original separable metric space. And this is the content of the last part of this section here when we discuss convergence and uniform tightness. So first of all, when our original space is separable, this metric space of probability measures with these two metrics is also separable. And if our original space is complete, then this metric space is also complete. So this is a statement of uh, Prokhorov theorem toward the end. This completeness result is based on uh, this intermediate result here, which is some sort of analog of the Arzela-Scoli theorem. More precisely, it gives a characterization when a subset of probability measures P is totally bounded with respect to this levy prokhorov and bounded Lipschitz metrics. And the most important characterization here is in part one in terms of the uniform tightness of, of this set. But Again, the details we'll discuss more in the next video. And right now I just wanted to emphasize again that the main point of this section is that the probability measures with weak convergence form a nice metric space when the original metric space is also nice. And this section is probably the most important part of, of the whole chapter 4. Okay, then in section 4.3 we prove Strassen's theorem and as one of its consequences we will prove some precise inequalities between the bounded Lipschitz and levy prokhorov metrics that we introduced in the previous section. So here in the beginning of this section we, we start by considering two random variables x and y defined on the same probability space and taking values in the same metric space S. And then we define what is called the key fund distance between them, uh, which is denoted here as alpha. Okay, basically what this quantity means that uh, if alpha is less than some epsilon, then the distance between these functions or these two random variables x and y is less than epsilon, except maybe on a set of measure epsilon. Okay, so this quantity tells us how close the two random variables are typically to each other. Now in this first lemma here we prove that this key fund metric actually metrizes convergence and probability but the main interest to us uh, will be its relation to the levy prokhorov metric. Okay so in this next lemma here we make a simple observation which actually if you take a look here it, it has a one line proof that this levy prokhorov distance between the distribution of x and the distribution of y is actually bounded by the key fund distance between random variables x and y. Okay, so of course it, this inequality depends on the definition of the levy prokhorov distance and this key fund metric, but what this reflects is that the closeness of two random variables as functions is, you know, in some sense a stronger statement that than closeness of their distributions. 
Okay, however, the, the main result of this section, the Strassen's theorem, will allow us to reverse this statement in some sense and to show that for some choices of x and y, this actually can be made into an equality. Okay. Now, the theorem itself is, um, the way it's stated here is a little bit more general, but the main point of, of what it says it will be the following. It's actually easier to um, explain in, in the notation of this lemma here. So, what Strassen's theorem says is that if you are given the distribution of random variable, let's say P, and the distribution of another random variable, say Q, and you are given the Levy uh, Prokhar of distance between them, then you can construct a special pair of uh, random variables X and Y such that, uh, first of all, they do have these prescribed distributions um, on the left hand side and such that this inequality becomes equality. Okay, so, in other words, closeness of distributions in the levy prokhorov metric can be witnessed in a stronger sense on some concrete random variables x and y that are close to each other except on some um, small set. Okay. So, this is a very powerful statement and it has various important consequences. But one cor corollary that we will consider in this section, so let me uh, scroll to it. As you can see, the, the proof of Strassen's theorem will be a bit lengthy, but in this lemma here toward the end, we will see that um, the bounded Lipschitz metric and the levy prokhorov metric can be compared by these explicit inequalities. Okay, so, in the last section we saw that both of them metrize convergence in probability, but here we also prove that these two metrics are actually equivalent, and moreover, we have these um, precise inequalities between them. But again, to, to summarize and emphasize this section, the main uh, message here is that um, the closeness of distributions in levy prokhorov metric can be witnessed in a stronger sense by on a pair of random variables with those prescribed distributions. And moreover, it's not just a qualitative statement, it's a quantitative statement in the sense that you have the equality of these two um, distances, the levy prokhorov distance and the Kifan metric. Okay, so that's uh, the content of section 4.3. Okay, then in section 4.4 we define yet another metric on probability measures called the Wasserstein metric and also we'll prove a famous result about it called the kantarovich rubinstein theory. Okay, so the definition of this metric is given right here in this equation and for now we are not discussing any details of all these different definitions but of course one can ask what, you know, why, why do we need another metric? And in one direction, this will be partially illustrated in the exercises at the end of this section. So basically, each definition is different and has its own unique features that can be quite useful when working with it. And so Wasserstein uh, distance is, in this sense, quite unique and very useful in applications. So hopefully the exercises will give some hint about why. Now we will also see some applications in the next section uh, which will be based on the main result in this section, the kantarovich rubinstein theorem. Now in this theorem we will prove that on a separable metric space this Wasserstein distance is equal to this other quantity written right here. Uh, denoted gamma p of q, p and q, which is defined very similar to the bounded Lipschitz metric, only with the boundedness condition removed, but a priori it looks very different from the Wasserstein uh, metric. Well, magically these two quantities turn out to be the same, and the proof will also be a beautiful application of the Hahn-Banach theorem. 
Okay, finally, at the end of this section, we will prove some generalization of this Kantarovich Rubinstein theorem. Okay, finally, let's jump to section 4.5. Okay, so in this section, we will start by proving a couple of classical inequalities which are of great interest on their own, such as the brun minkowski inequality here, and then prekop landler inequality. And after that, we will introduce another measure of similarity between probability measures called kolbach leibler divergence. Okay, it's written right here, and then in the setting of Gaussian measures, we will relate uh, this kullback leibler divergence uh, to the Wasserstein distance from the previous section, where we will use this Kantarovich-Rubinstein duality theorem. Okay, and this inequality here is, is known as Talagrand's quadratic transportation cost inequality. Then, as another application of this, we will prove another classical concentration of Gaussian measure inequality. And then we will wrap up this section and this chapter with some related results. Okay, so this uh, basically uh, concludes the general overview of chapter 4. Okay, and finally, I wanted to make a few general comments about a weak convergence of probability measure, measures, which are kind of good to keep in mind from the very beginning. And most of these, by the way, appear in section 4.2. Now, the general idea here is that typically we will work with the separable metric spaces. But in some situations, we can, for free, think that the metric space is also complete and in some other cases we can even think that or we can pretend that the metric space we are working with is, is compact. So let me um, mention the reason why, why that is. Okay, well first of all the reason why we would like to have completeness is because when our metric space is both separable and complete then uh, in chapter 1, we learned Ulam's theorem, right, which says that, that given a probability measure on the Borel sigma algebra on our space and given arbitrary positive epsilon, we can find a compact K such that the probability of this compact is at least 1 minus epsilon. So most of the weight is concentrated on this compact. And of course, this is very useful when working with convergence of probability measures because when we are looking at integrals of continuous bounded functions or bounded Lipschitz functions, we can of course break this integral into the part on the compact and the part on the complement. Okay, and the second piece here, because the function is bounded, and the probability of, of outside of this complex is small, we can think of this as being small. So essentially, you know, we can almost imagine that our probability space is compact because, you know, the main part of, of these integrals that we look, we consider uh, is the integral on the compact. Now, of course, there are some additional technical detail, but that's kind of a basic idea why we can in this case, sometimes think of our space as essentially being a compact. All right, now in the case when our metric space is separable, but not necessarily complete, the reason we can sometimes think that this space is complete is because we can in fact just consider a completion. So we can consider a metric space, a metric space D, which is a completion of our original metric space. And the main point here is that the open sets in the completion intersected with the original space exactly give us the set of all open sets on the original metric space. Okay, and of course as a result, 
when we, when we look at all Borel sets and the completion, when we intersect it with original metric space, we, we get all Borel sets in the original space. And the way this can be used is, is as follows, that let's say we have probability measure on the Borel sigma algebra on the original metric space. Okay, then what we can do is we can basically define some corresponding probability measure, let's call it p hat, on the completion, on the Borel sigma algebra on the completion. And the way you can do this is given a Borel set in, in the completion, you can simply define this uh, new probability to be probability of, or the original probability of the set A intersected with the original metric space S. And this is well defined exactly because this intersection here is a measurable set on the original space, so its probability is defined, and you can easily check that this p hat is, is a probability on uh, the completion. Okay, and then because you can do this, if you have uh, some theorem here that you prove under the assumption of, let's say, some probability and completion, you can often immediately transfer it back to a corresponding theorem on the original metric space by, by this construction, right? You can simply translate the statement for these uh, measures p hat to the original measures. So some, when, when you can do this, then you can essentially uh, imagine that your metric space is, is complete even when it's, it's just separable. Now, interestingly, you cannot do the other way around. So this construction here doesn't work if you start with, let's say, if, if you are given a probability, let's call it p hat, on the completion, right? Suppose you want to define some corresponding probability measure on the original space. Now, well, how would you do this? So maybe, you know, one thing you can say, well, this, this set here, this is a um, Borel set on the original space S. You want to define probabilities on, on uh, those sets. You can say, well, it's, a, it's already inside S, so it's inside the completion. Maybe I can just assign this to be a probability P hat on the completion. But the problem here is that this set may be not measurable on the completion. Even the original uh, metric space S here, so you know, if you plug in the whole space S, you want this probability to be 1. But when you plug it into P hat, it may be undefined. Okay, you, Your original space may be uh, not a measurable set in its completion, so you cannot actually work uh, in this direction. Okay, but in any case, the first construction by, you know, using this observation that you can kind of, given probability on the original space, you can transfer it to the completion, and then depending what statement is on that side, you can sometimes automatically bring it back to the original, let's say, just separable metric space. Okay, so that's that's why you can often think of separable metric spaces as being automatically complete. All right, and in another direction, uh, we can also sometimes think that our uh, metric space is, is actually a compact, okay? And that's when we deal with some statements where the precise definition of, of the metric that does not really matter to us. So, you know, one, one thing to notice is that if you have a metric D and some equivalent metric E, in a sense that have a sequence here converging with respect to metric D, this is equivalent to convergence with respect to metric E. Then these two metrics are equivalent. Well, in that case, of course, the space of continuous bounded functions is the same with respect to the first 
metric and the second metric. So actually, the set of functions on which we check the convergence of probability measures does not depend on the metric. It only depends on, on the topology. So if we can take advantage of this, and if the statement that we are trying to prove does not specifically refer to the metric D, but just to weak convergence of probability measures, you can actually take an equivalent metric to your advantage. And then it turns out that when your space, metric space is separable, okay, there will be a lemma that we'll, we will prove, then you can always find a metric E equivalent to the original metric such that space S with this equivalent metric is, is totally bounded. Okay, this can always be done. And so from the beginning, if you only care about the topology and you, you do not refer to a specific metric, you can assume that your metric space is totally bounded. And then if you do that completion operation that I just described, you can also assume that the metric is complete. Or maybe even, you know, you, you don't need to do the completion operation in the way that I describe above, but simply use the fact that the completion is, is compact and derive from it some, some statement that you might use right away on the original totally bounded metric space. Okay, after this change of metric, you can you, you, your metric space is basically uh, almost a compact. So again, the, the summary here is that when you work with uh, separable metric spaces, sometimes you can imagine or pretend that it's also complete and in other times you can uh, pretend that it's, it's basically compact depending on what kind of statement you are trying to prove. Okay, and so that will end this review of, of chapter 4.